and welcome you to the third webinar hosted by NewGen. And we have our guest host today, Steve Pereira, whose topic, as you know, is less is more, map the value of your product. So it's very exciting and, and I hope to learn a lot today from Steve. So Steve is a founder of, of Visible, where he helps teams improve their software delivery performance. Steve is a leading authority on value stream mapping. So we're, we're in good hands today. Uh, previously, he was uh, the founding CTO of Statflow and is a lifetime workflow automator. I love that, that sounds great. Uh, Steve also leads the Toronto DevOps community. So I'm sure many of you uh, may have seen him there. And um, so I'm excited, as I said, to learn a lot from Steve today. This is really cool. We also have Joanna Tivik, as many of you know, Joanna is an agile transformation expert, uh, focusing on exec executing digital strategies and building high performing cultures, not just teams, but cultures. So that's obviously within the organization. Uh, Joanna has been an instructor of U of T SCS for more than 10 years. Uh, Joanna is also partnering with me and a few other folks on uh, bringing an open space uh, on, in June to the uh, community. So uh, if you want more information, we can provide that later. It can be a lot of fun. Um, and last but not least is Peter Monkhouse. Peter is an experienced speaker, educator, and consultant. Um, which is, it's going to be hard to believe that he has over 40 years of experience. So I can't believe that. That was um, a script. You made it up. I did. <laughs> uh, well, actually 10 years then. Okay. Um, it was experience. He's leading teams and organization. Uh, Peter believes that projects deliver, or, sorry, projects deliver products and products deliver strategy. So cool. So just a reminder, we are recorded. Um, if you don't want to be on, please, uh, you can turn off your camera. Um, anyway, so the format of this, it's a, it's a panel discussion. Steve will present and then we'll go into panel discussion with questions and answers. Um, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, the approach that we want to take today is that you ask the questions in the chat and both Peter and Joanne, I believe, will be going through those and asking those questions to Steve throughout. So please, at any time, at any time enter them in chat and we'll be on them. So now I want to hand it over to Steve to take it away with, uh, along with Joanne and Peter, and I hope you enjoy the day, or the hour anyway. All Thanks, here, Trish. Steve. Thank you, Trish. So um, really appreciate you joining us, Trish, and taking the time out of your day to introduce this session. So as, um, you meant, as you all know, Trish is heavily involved in the Agile community with multiple events, as she mentioned, the one coming up in a couple of weeks with Open Space. So hopefully you'll be able to attend that, and we'll see you there. So if you do want to ask questions, as Tris mentioned, please just um, uh, say it in the chat. It, we're relatively small. We're expecting more. If it stays small, we'll raise your hand and we can open up the mics as well. So um, let's get started and let's start hearing from Steve and we're very pleased to have Steve with us. So I'm a relatively newbie to value stream mapping and Steve and Joanna have been trying to educate me about what value stream mapping is. But it seems to me that this is really very similar to what I used to know as business process reengineering. So, you know, it seems there's nothing new in this world. It's always just being recycled old stuff. So, Steve, what do you think? Is this similar to business uh, process reengineering? Uh, it's a great question. I, actually, I find there is a lot of similarity between a lot of techniques in optimization and improvement, right? Essentially, we're either looking at efficiency, value, uh, performance, and a lot of these techniques share a lot of common attributes and, and methodologies, certainly goals and outcomes. I think that, you know, traditionally what we've seen with something like business process optimization is a focus on efficiency, you know, uh, focus on getting it done, uh, either as quickly or as cost effectively uh, or with the least amount of resources as possible. And um, where I see a difference with value stream thinking is really focusing on outcomes and maximizing outcomes. Um, and there's less consideration on uh, dialing everything to, to be extremely efficient and effective. What we're, we're focused on is maximizing value. 
and maximizing value in the context of a customer, uh, which I think is an, a really important distinction, and I think which is why this is becoming very popular now, is that you know we have so much focus on customer experience now. We have so much focus on who's going to be affected by what we create, and not just creating for the sake of creating and and you know crossing our fingers and hoping that somebody wants it. Uh, where we were with you know traditional product development and, and production prior where we would sort of do market research and come up with some ideas and maybe incrementally improve on a, a, an existing product, you know, make a better widget. Now we're looking at entirely new ways of seeing the world, right? And how to kind of revolutionize instead of just evolve um, customer outcomes and customer experiences. So um, in essence, there's a lot of overlap, but I really think that the the change in focus towards value and customers is really what makes a difference here. And it really helps frame people's thinking and gets people thinking in the right direction rather than uh, minimizing and optimizing and shaving, shaving things down. We're looking at how do we just get the best outcome? Mm -hmm. Hey, great. Thank, thank you. So then how would you compare to what Lean Six Sigma does, because they also tend to have looking at the best outcome and very much on reducing waste. But how's the, the difference there? Yeah, so Six Sigma has been around for a very long time. Um, I would say that, you know, value stream mapping is a, is a uh, it's an area inside of Six Sigma. That's how I originally learned about it. So I come from uh, tech support originally and moved into software development. I was always kind of fascinated with uh, larger scale and, and the capabilities that you get from working online and on the internet and, and, and what you can do with software. And uh, at a part of my career, I, was, I think I was an IT director at a brokerage firm. Uh, one of my bosses said, you know, um, we've got some education budget, what do you want to do with it? And I never got a degree. I, I wanted to go back to school and I went to a business tech program to get my degree and I eventually gave up on that because I didn't, I didn't like it at all. I didn't like the material. I didn't like the Six Sigma stuff. I didn't like all the legacy focus on manufacturing and traditional ways of working because I was involved in what was next, what was coming, you know, the software, scalability, everything being online and connected. And all the programs at the time and Lean Six Sigma and, and a lot of this material was focused on legacy ways of working, but doing old things better than uh, we have in the past. And I think that that's great. There's always a place for optimization. There's always a place for making things better. But uh, what I wasn't getting from Six Sigma is the idea that value is the ultimate motivator. You know, customer outcomes are the ultimate uh, goal here. And what we want to be doing is trying to maximize that, not trying to, you know, uh, optimize and dial in everything that we're doing because we could be doing the wrong thing. You know, it's very common for people who are focused entirely on process and focused entirely on efficiency to, you know, go 200 miles an hour in the wrong direction, right? And uh, we see a lot of that now in, uh, in the DevOps world, in the software world, in the CI CD world where we're getting better and better at all this stuff. You know, now we can push code to production extremely rapidly, thousands of times a day. And uh, how do we know that we're doing, how do we know that we're delivering anything of value? You know, we can be delivering to production constantly, but we always have to be thinking of the value of what we're doing, right? And so we can easily be doing the wrong things very efficiently. Uh, and reframing our thinking in terms of value, I think, really uh, changes the game and gets us all aligned on the ultimate goal. That's great. And I think that's, that's the reason why we invited you here, because we wanted to link that back to the product and the product lifecycle and the role of the product owner in delivering that value to customers and how we can help the product owners deliver the value. So here is yet another tool for them to consider together with the agile frameworks and, and other tools that you can do around customers just to deliver that value, to, to get closer to customers and, and understand their needs. So see, maybe we can just pick up, when you talk about value, you've mentioned value for customers, you mentioned efficiency, 
are there other things that you view when you say value? Because that word is very broad and encompass of, can encompass a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, value, I mean, that is, that's an incredibly entertaining and potentially uh, challenging topic. Uh, I love talking and thinking about value because ultimately that's, that's the goal of everything I do. I think it's the goal of everything that we all do. So, uh, and we tend to avoid it because it's challenging, but you know, you can't run away from the thing that you have to deal with. And value is ultimately that thing that that 800 pound gorilla that's in the room staring at you. If you're not thinking about it, if you're not addressing it, you're missing out. You know, you could be wasting uh, time, energy, morale. There's a lot uh, that goes into that. I think that there's a couple examples that I like to think about um, because value, people mix it up with quality a lot. And they'll think, you know, if I just create something of high quality, it will be high value. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, I can make a stainless steel gold plated um, wine bottle opener. And, you know, if it doesn't work as well, uh, if the experience of using it isn't as good as the $2 uh, corkscrew that I have, then um, it has no value to me, right? It could be extremely high value. You know, it could weigh 30 pounds and that, that could make it extremely high quality. It could be indestructible, but I don't want to carry it around, right? So it's not going in my picnic basket. Um, I think of things like Kickstarter, right? Where people pay for things that don't even exist, you know, based on potential value. Right. So that's another consideration. Um, a lot of times people think about value as like what someone pays you for. And you, you don't know what it is until they give you the money. But Kickstarter kind of disproves that. Right. We can find value in things that are potential and that we believe in, you know, because we find value in the potential and, and what could be. And, you know, that's based on risk. It's based on reputation, trust. There's all kinds of factors in there. Social proof is another thing. You know, we have an entire sneaker industry where people will camp out overnight to buy a pair of sneakers that ultimately is going to cost the same, whether you care about uh, Air Force Ones or not, you know, the price doesn't change. Maybe there's a scenario where you have an exclusive access and that costs more and you get it six weeks before everyone else. That is a value that you're adding to a sneaker that costs $10 to make, right? And it's going to wear out the same rate as every other sneaker, but somebody on the market would pay $400 for that. Somebody would only pay $30 for that because it's a different value. Um, and I think so much of this is rooted in customer experience, right? What does it actually mean to use these products and experience them and be a part of them? And now this is connected to communities and it's connected to identity. And there's so much involved that, Value is, is not a simple subject, but, it's, but it's, like, it's a subject we can't ignore. We really have to be talking more about it. Absolutely. So um, I've got a question here, but before I get there, maybe we can just go back and talk a little bit about what is a, what is a value stream? What are we talking about in like 30 seconds or less for my simplistic mind? <laughs> 30 seconds or less is always a challenge for me, as, as you may have noticed already, but I'll do my best. So a value stream really, you know, there's a lot of parallel to process. Uh, we're talking about a sequence of events from, uh, let's say, demand to fulfillment, right? So I have an idea and I want to make it real. I have a request from my customer. I have a bug. I have something that I need to fix. Uh, how long does it take and what's involved in making that happen, right? So getting, uh, getting a product to my customer. And in the traditional world, the value stream where this originated was in auto manufacturing, right? So it became very complex. Uh, we wanted to drive up that efficiency and profitability of making cars. We wanted to make it more predictable. So when you have multiple suppliers, you have raw materials, you have a large and complex supply chain where you've got to be assembling all this in time and shipping it out to customers. The value stream is really the start to finish series of events and measurements that go into creating that value and delivering it to customers. And I think the, the main differentiator is 
uh, measurement. And, and that's the difference between a process map and a lot of what people are comfortable with and used to, because the measurement really gives you, I would say 80% of the value of the value stream. Without it, you just have something that sits in a knowledge base, it's just a static document. The measurement is what makes it real and tangible. And, and what we talk about when, when I mention me measurement is, is the timing involved, um, who's involved in the value stream. So, so when are we handing work from one person to another? What is the information flow? And um, you can get really sophisticated with the measurement. You can get into value. So you can get into how much of this is actually dedicated to creating value and how much of it is supporting that value creation and how much of it is not actually creating any value. Yeah, so with that, let's move on to the question that Hassan has asked here is that people will argue that a value stream is the most economic way to prioritize up on work, but identifying and funding value streams instead of projects or backlog. What's your comment on that? I, I think it's, it, it's a great question and, and I agree. You know, if we're thinking uh, about how do we prioritize, how do we decide what to do? Where should we be putting our time and energy? A lot of times that's based on either gut instinct or pain and frustration. You know, where, are we, where do we think, uh, where are we seeing friction? Um, a lot of it gets based on other organizations, you know, so Salesforce is doing this, Netflix is doing this, we should do it, we should do it. Um, none of that really carries any kind of data behind it, right? So. Um, it's difficult for people to trust that that is the right decision. It's difficult to be satisfied with those decisions. Um, it's difficult to say, okay, well, we have a list of 50 things. What do we put on the top? You know, how do we order these in, in terms of priority? And it's, you know, in some cases you get into things like net present value and strictly financial metrics, but in value stream thinking and value stream mapping, what we're looking at is, the system by which we create and deliver value. So we're, we're worried about how do we predictably and sustainably uh, continuously deliver value, right? Not just once, not just uh, you know, a project at a time. What is the day-to-day -day that we are building this assembly line that creates value for our customers? And so I really think that um, you know, the value stream focus on uh, measurements that matter to productivity, performance, efficiency, uh, frustration, um, give us a picture of where we should go because the measurement kind of supports uh, one decision over another. And what happens is you'll have one step in the process that takes two weeks. We can decide, okay, well, is that two weeks valuable or not? You know, how much of that two weeks is actually creating value? Are we waiting around? Is it two weeks where uh, we're incurring that penalty because we have one person who can do it and they're on vacation? Um, we have to look at the, the data and the measurement to actually figure out where should we be investing in automation and improvement. Steve, I have a question. Go ahead, Hudson. Okay, thank you. Um, my, my question is that when you talk about the measurement, right? Um, and we're trying to compare two value streams, right? Uh, when is, are we, so efficiency can be calculated using different types of measures. So one value stream maybe has a different type of value and we calculate its efficiency score and another value stream has a different type of value and we calculate its efficiency score on that kind of value. How do we compare, do this apple to apples comparison when they're both based on different types of value streams? Um, but that's a good question, actually. So if we're talking about different types of value streams, just to kind of paint that picture, we could be talking about a software delivery value stream, right? And we can also be talking about a customer onboarding value stream, right? So what are the steps involved in creating software and bringing a customer onto our platform or our product? And so those are very, very different. How do we measure them in a way that we can compare them? Um, is that the question or is it comparing two software delivery value streams and, and trying to find an apples to apples there? No, it's, it's in the backlog, right? The backlog could have many different types of items in it. So if you are trying to uh, drive the prioritization of the backlog via value stream mapping, right? 
how do we compare these two things when some one thing is based on a different value stream and other thing is based on a different value stream? Okay, that's a good question. So, I mean, in the context of where uh, value stream mapping is commonly being applied, what we're looking at is a single backlog, you know, where this, the backlog is feeding the value stream. If we've got separate backlogs feeding separate value streams, then we can separate the improvement of each value stream into each backlog. In a case where we have a single backlog and we're trying to prioritize, the first thing I would do is break them up by, by product. Um, if, if we're combining and you just have a giant list, that becomes, that's challenging even without thinking of value streams. You know, that's just challenging from a product perspective. Um, but what we're really talking about when we're talking about value stream mapping is improving the the process by which we deliver value, not necessarily features. We're not talking about things that we're delivering to customers. So this isn't going to tell you whether you should ship um, your authentication improvements or your new, uh, new UI, right? Those are still product only decisions and that's based on the value of those features. What we're talking about is where should we be improving the process by which we deliver features, by which we develop and deliver features. So if we're looking at a value stream for software delivery, for instance, and it takes us two weeks to settle on the requirements um, and figure out what are the non-functional, what are the functional, what are the technical considerations, where is the technical debt involved, um, who do we need on this uh, to, to execute at a high, uh, high degree of performance, then we can say, okay, well, if that takes two weeks, how much of that is valuable? Should we, should it be one week? Should it be uh, one week with three people? Should it be one week with one person? That can, that's what we can get out of the value stream mapping exercise. Um, and it can help us decide whether we do that or we focus on something like automated deployment. So uh, an example here is that I was brought into a very, very large company with very, very complex value streams. And what they, what they, the situation was they had a lot of money to spend on improvements. Their hypothesis was if we build automated deployment, uh, that'll improve our performance and allow us to deliver better, faster, cheaper, happier. Um, and they wanted me to come in to validate that assumption, right? And to to check the math and, and actually measure and figure out whether that was a good decision or not. We mapped the value stream. Uh, there were two hot spots in the value stream and it, they weren't uh, related to deployment at all. They were actually environment provisioning. So how we set up test environments and staging environments. And the other was automated testing. So most of the time and effort and frustration and friction was in those two areas and not in automated deployment. So um, what it does is it saves millions of dollars. It saves months of effort. Uh, it saves the team from, you know, feeling like they've picked the wrong priority and they were able to validate all of that measurement and feel very confident that investing in uh, automated testing was going to have a very specific, very valuable outcome. And I'd like to add to that, like working in big organizations, what's happening with the funding process is very secluded and very siloed. So you have these cost centers in your organization and they get funded by the different divisions. So you go into these cost centers, but you go deep. You never look at the big picture. So that's what I think the mapping also solves, is mapping your value streams and seeing the big picture. So then you can actually look at them and say, okay, so there is more value here than here. And, and maybe we should focus in this area rather than focus on something that maybe, you know, we're doing less value or never uh, uh, the value that we're expecting. So that's what I've seen with the difference in, in doing funding differently at the value stream level and not at the cost center level. Absolutely. Totally agree. Great. Thank you. Um, so Laurel's got a question here, here as well, Steve, somewhat, um, well, I guess talking about the 
the value stream more generally. So have you ever had an experience in which the final value of value stream is negative? What were the factors that would lead to that outcome? And what decisions should this drive going forward? That's a great question. Uh, luckily, I have never had an experience of an entirely negative value stream. I think if we were getting close to that scenario, the level of frustration in the team would be so high that um, something would happen before you actually looked at mapping the value stream. You know, the scenario would be that this, uh, this product or service isn't delivering anything that customers want to pay for. Um, and in that case, you, you usually know before you hit a point where you're going into negative value. That being said, there are, it's very, very common to have uh, a value stream that's delivering surprisingly little value uh, relative to the amount of effort and the amount of time invested. And, uh, and also in the, you know, the, let's say financial outcomes of the value stream. Um, a, a typical uh, scenario when I go in to do a current state value stream map with a customer is that we immediately find 20% of the value stream that we can eliminate or improve. So um, just by looking at the big picture, like Joanna mentioned, by stepping away and mapping it out, things just start to pop out. And all of a sudden you can see, well, okay, what if we didn't do this step? Or what if we just did this in an email instead of a meeting, right? Um, you start to look at scenarios like that where um, you've got these activities that are done because we've just always done it this way, right? And by stepping away, you can discover, okay, well, what if we did this a little bit differently? What if we did this uh, as a discussion in Slack? when it needs to be done instead of scheduling it, trying to get it on everybody's calendar, uh, trying to make sure that no one's away on vacation because they're an important voice. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to look at these uh, kind of low hanging fruit opportunities and dramatically improve the value of the value stream. So it's not uncommon for me to get something like a, uh, 30 or 60 times ROI on uh, doing a value stream mapping exercise because there's so much hidden potential in there. And it's because we just organically grow these things day after day by doing the same thing a little bit worse with a little bit more complexity, a little bit less visibility, a little bit more assumption versus data. And you get, you know, sometimes years and years into this process and, uh, by stepping away, it just pops out at you and, and, and suddenly you realize that uh, there's all this potential and, and sometimes risk in, uh, in the value stream. Certainly in this situation where, you know, we are all working remotely and, and there's been so much disruption, looking at all of our value streams right now and seeing what do we need to do together co-located? You know, did we actually need to be in that room uh, working this out? Or could we do this asynchronously, right? Uh, how much waste can we eliminate to do more with less? And I think that that's incredibly valuable and incredibly important right now, but I would argue that it's always important. And it's something that we constantly have to be doing because if we're not getting maximum value and output and outcome from our value streams, someone else is going to. Someone else is gonna come along and do it better um, because they're coming in with fresh eyes. And this is what disruption is all about, is these outside perspectives where people come into the market with a slightly different perspective, thinking about things in a new way and focusing on value and customer outcomes. And they realize, I don't need a gigantic enterprise to deliver this value. You know, we look at Zoom versus uh, Google Hangouts and all these players that were doing this video conferencing thing for years and years and years and years. You know, the earliest players in the game, like Cisco, um, you know, they're in the dust right now because they were incrementally, organically just doing things the way that they always were doing them. And someone like Zoom comes along and says, what are the absolute minimum things that we need to do to deliver value? And how do we make that experience uh, of maximum value? And that's, that's what it's all about. And you can, you can look at their, uh, 
their stock performance, it's, it's outrageous. Yeah. So one of the, go ahead, Joanna, sorry. Just, just to add to that, because I think there is a question there that's very important, what decisions should drive going forward? Like if you see negative value or you don't see any value in your value stream, it's okay to kill your product as well. Like it's not, you know, like it's okay to say, either retire it or do something about it, but it's also okay to kill it. Because I, I see a lot of organizations going through their products that don't deliver any value, they don't make any sales, they don't do anything with it, and then they they uh, nag or they delay the decision to kill it or, or you know, to, to, to take it out from the market. And, and that's okay because then you learn from it and next time you know what to do. So I think it's also important to, to mention that. I guess in my experience in going back to the, the old ancient version of business process re-engineering of this, was that organizations, whether it be because of politics or culture, refuse to drop processes, eliminate them, they add on. And that's where you see this, I saw this negative impact occurring because, oh, here's another process or here's another something else we should do. It got added on instead of removed. And that's where you got this, and this process. And it happened, I saw a number of times. So the key was, okay, we got to change the culture. We have to change and get people used to the new technology, the new way of doing things and not add it on to the old way as well. So that's the part I would add to this. It's a lot around culture change and organizational change. Okay, so um, let's get down into some of the nuts and, and bolts around this value stream mapping, Steve, because I know you've got lots of experience in this. So you sold me. How do I get started? What do I do? That's a great question. So um, really, I think the starting point will probably surprise people. I think that as with any kind of exercise where we're introducing something new into an organization, uh, number one, we wanna start small, right? You don't want to bet the farm on something like this, especially if this is thinking people aren't used to or an activity people aren't used to, uh, starting with a group that is either, um, you know, ready for change, ready for a new approach, ready for something new or, or uh, or needing something like that um, is, is a great way to start. So starting small is really important. Identifying a value stream that is either, uh, there's a lot of opportunity um, believed to be in the value stream. You know, people get a sense of, there's just so much friction in this, or this is, you know, I know that there's a lot of waste here. Uh, that can help you identify what to start with. Um, but often what I start with with value streams is just a high level understanding of the organization because I come in as a facilitator. My job is to, is to really make no assumptions, right? Um, which is the, the value of a facilitator, right? You can come in with a fresh pair of eyes. And so we start very, very high level, you know, tell me about your business. How does, how do your customers get value from what you provide? And then we dig in as we find either uh, different hypotheses that we want to analyze uh, or, you know, we know where those areas of, or we suspect those areas of really high waste or frustration or friction are, are present. Um, but the real important piece before you even, you know, start mapping is the aspect of psychological safety. And I think that's the piece that really suffers when people try and do this internally. It's the idea that, uh, you know, we do have politics, we do have culture. Um, it's very challenging to step out of your role and look at uh, the way we're doing things without casting judgment, without um, framing it in a way uh, that, you know, we're failing and this needs to change, you know. So I would say half of my job as a facilitator coming into organizations is not only providing my expertise, but providing that safety and saying to the leaders, this is not judgment on you. You know, what we're looking at when we are mapping a value stream is judging the system, right? We're evaluating the system, we're improving the system, and we start wherever the organization is. You know, we're not measuring based on Netflix or 
Microsoft or anybody else. We're measuring based on ourselves uh, at this moment, knowing that we got here the only way that we could have gotten here, right? So I think that injecting psychological safety is absolutely critical and, and maintaining a safe space because it is hard to look at um, what we've been doing for ages and ages, you know, because we know there's waste there. We know we've been wasting time. And, you know, we can look at, uh, we can look at this in our, in our personal lives and, and it will always resonate that, you know, stepping away uh, is a humbling, challenging uh, activity, but it needs to be done. If you're gonna make changes, you have to look at the, the reality and the truth and the data. And so um, that I think is absolutely critical foundation. But once we get into the point of uh, mapping and the team is prepared, we kind of assemble a group where we have uh, leadership. So people who can change things, people who are invested and incentivized to change things. Uh, because if no one's incentivized to do this, it's gonna be really uh, an exercise in futility. So we have to have clear outcomes and goals in mind. Uh, so identifying those, it, it really helps us figure out, okay, who would be involved? Um, we want people who are able to make decisions, who are invested in the outcomes of decisions. Uh, we want people who are doing work on a regular basis. We have to include the people doing the work uh, to get the perspective from the ground, from the, 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 uh, the trenches, as it were. And um, once we assemble that group, Nowadays, what I'm doing is value stream mapping remotely. You know, it doesn't have to be all in the same room. We can easily do it over a Zoom conference with a whiteboard or a presentation software like um, Miro or Mural, I like to use a lot. I've used Google Drawings in a pinch. I've used spreadsheets. Uh, it really doesn't matter what you use in terms of tools. Obviously, it's great when you can all get in a room and, and have a whiteboard, but not everybody has that space. Not everybody can schedule that. It's very expensive to do that. So I actually prefer the remote first approach because not only is it easy to organize and execute, there is a degree of safety where, you know, nobody's going to be staring at you and, and calling on you directly in, in front of a room and getting you to stand up and talk or or you know, have the entire focus of the room. You can type uh, you know, if you want. Uh, you could turn off your video if you're not comfortable. Uh, there's a lot of options there, I think, that, that in increase safety. And, um, and then having it all digital makes it easier to share afterwards, right? It's, we can share it very quickly. Uh, people can watch in real time. Whereas you know, in, in a whiteboard scenario where we're drawing on, on the wall, that really depends on the space. The space can be well appointed for that and it can be terrible for that. So having tools and, and doing this all digitally is actually a lot easier and I think it's, it all happens a lot quicker. So in terms of the, the activity itself, it's a couple of hours. I know a lot of cases where people take a week and weeks to do this and I think that's a big mistake. I think you know it's, it's an investment in uh, attention for people. It's an investment in time. It's very costly to tie up all these people in, in one place, uh, thinking about something for too long. So I try and cap it at like four hours would be the worst case scenario. And um, just to make sure that everyone stays sharp and engaged. But uh, I'm targeting like two hours to do a current state value stream map. And we map it out, um, basically the steps and timing. And then we'll iterate back if we want additional measurement. And there's all kinds of additional measurement you can, you can get into quality, value, uh, data, um, handoffs. There, there's a lot that you can dig into, but I think the absolute basics are pretty easy and quick to, to get out. And what you really want out of this is to focus on what to do next, right? So the, the future state comes after that. And I usually combine the future state with some form of capability mapping um, or some people might be familiar with like a skills matrix, because I think that once you decide to change things and improve, you have to know what you're able to do, right? You have to know what, what do we have? What, what, what can we leverage? What can we take advantage of to get us to better? And so looking at teams and looking at the organization and saying like, we've got skills in these areas, but we're missing, we're, there's a gap here and we either have to train somebody, we're gonna to have to pull someone from another team, we're gonna to have to hire for this, or bring in a consultant. 
uh, knowing that before you go down the road is, uh, is going to save you a lot of time and effort and frustration and cost. Yeah, I think it's great to um, see this idea of starting small and building, right? I would also add that my experience in doing this, that the, the tools, the electronic tools, in fact, some of the other benefits, or another benefit other than what you saw is that inevitably I would remember something afterwards, right? By that point, someone's all collected it, it's all gone, but if it's on the tool like Mural, right, then it's available to go in and add. Absolutely, yeah. Joanna, do you have a question like that? Yeah, I was thinking about it and you know, like we have the customer journey map and I think we should also um, map in people's mind, what does the customer journey map does in, in, and, and also the value stream map and how they come together because the customer journey map has those touch points of the customer with your organization. And those are very important and critical. And also you, in, in the customer journey map, you also document the pains that they have throughout the process and interactions with you as an organization. So how do you see that coming together? I think there's a lot of similarities. It's a, it's a great comparison to draw. Um, ultimately, I think they're focused in two different areas. Um, which is great because I don't think they step on each other's toes, but there are a lot of similarities, especially when you mention friction and frustration. Um, what we're really focused on when we're talking about value streams is how are we producing that customer journey? How are we empowering and enabling that customer journey? What is the machine by which we build the experiences for customers and improve that experience? So we're kind of focusing more after the value stream on the customer journey. So a common software delivery value stream, let's say, you will uh, ship the improvements or features to production, enable them, get traffic coming in, that's where the customer journey uh, might start. Mm -hmm. But the value really in looking at two of these things at the same time, and I don't think organizations are currently doing this a lot, but you need to overlap these things, right? Because what happens is uh, while you're producing the next big thing, while you're, while you're improving things, you wanna be letting customers know that it's coming, right? And prepare them. And you wanna make sure that the documentation and the success aspect of it is in place before you're turning that thing on. And so the customer journey starts before uh, a lot of people would think that it begins. It's not when you turn things on, it's when people need to know things, right? When they're going to get value from information, from preparation, from support materials. And then how does that wrap around to uh, how are you getting feedback out of your customer journey, right? Because the feedback is going to feed the value stream at the very beginning. Right. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, Steve, what are some of the common issues you find that your clients have with, with using value streams? Um, with using value streams are coming out of, like, revealed by uh, value stream mapping? Well, I'm going to start off with using, but the, the, your, the common themes you have with people find is also useful to hear as well. So let's start All with right. well, using the tool, then we'll go up the level to what you're finding. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So um, yeah, because I love talking about both. Really doing the exercise, I think, um, as I mentioned before, the piece that people often miss is uh, trying to do this with no experience. It's, it's going to be very challenging to get a, a positive outcome. And you don't get a million uh, you know, at-bats with this, right? You can't cry wolf a uh, hundred times. So if you're going to be pulling people together, uh, telling them to take time out of their day, asking them to do something challenging, uh, you, you better be doing a good job. You know, you, you, you better get it right. You better get the experience right. So if this is something you've never done before, um, it's, it's a lot to ask. Um, and the, the odds of success are very low because I mentioned the, the psychological safety aspect is so critical and the political aspect is so critical that um, I wouldn't advise people try to do this without facilitation or some form of uh, training. But I think a lot of training 
is very technical. You know, I haven't seen any of the training focused on improving the environment uh, and the psychological safety of the aspect. So I think that's, that's the one thing that, that people miss and it's very costly because all of a sudden when you get it wrong, nobody wants to do it again. You know, I don't want to go through that experience again. We did value stream mapping. I got called out in the middle of the meeting and everybody now thinks that I don't deliver any value to the organization, right? You're never going to get that person back in the room. Um, and that's very risky. There's a lot that can happen with leadership. If you, if you don't approach this right, all of a sudden, all that judgment uh, is centered and targeted towards the leadership. And all of a sudden, you know, this is a giant failure. How could you let all this waste accumulate? How could you let this go off the rails? Um, what do you actually do all day? Because this is a disaster. And uh, so you have to really make sure. And I would say that that is the biggest missing piece. Uh, the other, the other big one is just spending too much time on it. You know, it, it really needs to be, and that's another benefit of facilitation is that you got to move this thing or else you're going to lose engagement. You're going to lose people's patience. And, you know, if you get to the end of the value stream and people are just phoning it in, you've lost, you know, all of your perspective, right? It's just going to be a big cloud of, yeah, you know, that's a rough guess because I'm tired and I want to go eat lunch. Right. So to get value, you really have to, to have powerful facilitation to make sure that that value and engagement is at a maximum through the whole experience and people leave and they feel great. You know, you want people to come out of this feeling empowered and energized rather than drained and exhausted. And, and I think that that's often a side effect that I see with inexperienced teams trying to do this. Um, and then when it comes to outcomes of the, the activity, uh, the most common thing I would say is uh, just waiting time, right? Um, we find a lot of cases where uh, handoffs are not necessary. So taking one piece of work and, and giving it to another department or giving it to somebody else on the team uh, is wasting a lot of time because that, that handoff could be via email that people can miss or it goes into a system that no one ever looks at. Uh, or we need to schedule a meeting to transfer the, the knowledge or transfer the, the, the piece of work. And so you've got to schedule the meeting. You've got to make sure that it happens and, you know, you schedule a meeting and half of the time you don't even cover half the agenda. So there's really basic low level, um, low hanging fruit like that. And uh, it's very, very common to see things like meetings just for, for no reason or poorly executed or, you know, there's really no outcome of the meeting that's, that's adding value. Um, oftentimes there's, there's just the structure of the organization is not facilitating the value stream, right? You've got to go from uh, department to department trying to get things done. You know, you, you've got to open a ticket in a system because you can't do the thing that you need to do every two weeks or every three weeks. And uh, that's where you see this reorienting around the value stream and investing in like self-service tools is having a massive outcome, um, massive improvement because uh, what we wanna optimize when we're looking at the value stream is empowering people to do as much as they can within their sphere of expertise. So contribute as much as possible, work as uh, in flow as much as possible so that there's minimal handoffs, disruption, waiting, delays. And, and that's where we see a lot of improvement and a lot of improvement opportunities. Thank you. So we've got a couple of other questions that come in here, Steve. So you've talked a couple of times about the um, physiological, the psychological safety. So are there any techniques that you could share that how do you, when you facilitate a session, how do you build that in? How do you get people to feel safe that they can share without any retribution? Yeah, I think that, you know, a lot of it comes from experience of, of leading teams and individuals. I mean, I was, um, prior to this, I was CTO and, and I was leading a team of 30 people and I was leading leaders. And so a lot of coaching um, is focused on making people feel safe to share their challenges, to share their fears. Uh, so I think coaching experience really helps and the ability to ask questions in a constructive way uh, to let the team know that, you want their uh, input, you want their perspective. You're not trying to get them to say what you want by framing a question in a way that's, uh, that's driving a specific 
response. Um, I think laying the groundwork is very important. So what happens early on in an engagement for me is I do several presentations with different areas of the company. So I talk to the leaders and I frame the messaging in, in, uh, in ways that communicate with them. So as a leader, as, as a C-level leader in the past, I understand where their fears are and where their concerns are, uh, where their goals are. And so I've got a presentation specifically for them that's gonna resonate with them to, to address their fears and their concerns and their goals. And uh, then I've got another, you know, I was a technical individual contributor for years. So I can uh, craft messaging for developers and engineers in a way that makes them feel comfortable with the exercise and, and makes it very clear that we are where we are based on millions and billions of factors that are outside of our control, right? And this is not an exercise in judgment. This is not an exercise in uh, firing people or figuring out where we can uh, reallocate resources and, and give people more work. That's not what this is about. It's really about doing the most with what we have and feeling very confident and empowered while we do it. And I think that 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 messaging has to be there 100% of the time and it has to be crystal clear for people because oftentimes what happens with these exercises is we have me uh, messaging from leaders that, uh, you know, it says one thing, but we know that they mean something else. You know, we know that they're really focused on their outcomes and their incentives. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a very thinly veiled um, self-serving exercise. And so, Coming in from the outside, I don't have, you know, a, uh, I, I don't have that uh, requirement or incentive. I don't have my own agenda. I'm really there to be a mirror to the organization and, uh, you know, hopefully a flattering mirror uh, because I want to keep this as positive and, uh, and, and goal and outcome focused as possible. Good points. I think the two things that I found is one is the external facilitator gets rid of a lot of the political stuff that goes on in the room because you don't know what it is. But I also like the point about reinforcing with the leadership, they're showing their commitment and acting and saying, I mean, it's walk the talk around making it safe. So two other quick questions here before we wrap up. So one is um, around uh, possible training courses or if people wanted to know more about value stream mapping or get more, where would you recommend that they start to go a little bit further in depth to understand a little bit more about value stream mapping? That is, uh, that is a challenge. Uh, right now, uh, there's a fantastic book actually called Value Stream Mapping, unsurprisingly, uh, by a wonderful, um, very intelligent leader uh, in the space called Karen Martin. And um, that book is excellent. The, the challenge with it is that it's very broad. It's not focused on uh, software technology or, or modern businesses. Um, so there's a lot in traditional manufacturing and where value stream mapping comes from. And I find that that can get in a lot of people's way. You know, if you look at a traditional value stream map, if you, if you look it up on Wikipedia, the example of a value stream map is incredibly complex and you can't really read it unless you've got some education with Six Sigma or some kind of a business degree. So a lot of people, they get defeated before they even start with this material. Um, I have a series of articles that I've created for my website um, that really get to the bare bones, like the, the basics and, and start from, you know, what is a value stream and how do you do value stream mapping? How do you identify uh, good areas to map? Um, and I'm always trying to improve that. But I'm, I'm also always happy to jump on a call with someone and take them through anything that they need to know about it. So um, I don't think that there's a lot of great material out there. It's still kind of early days for uh, an ecosystem to develop around this. Um, I have seen a couple um, good eBooks that I can share. And um, I do have a, actually a list of resources on my website if, if for anyone who wants to know more. So we'll put a blog up with the link to this recording as well as to your website, Steve, so people can follow from there on ours, newgenp.com. So great, thank you. So just last question, big question, but keep it brief because we're gonna run out of time here. Not as bad as the CBC with the clock stopping us, but close. 
what do you see or what's next for value stream mapping? Uh, great question. Yeah, so real quick, I think uh, two things, uh, awareness and adoption, right? Um, a lot of people, uh, they either stop before they start because they encounter legacy value stream mapping and it just seems overly complex and, and hard to understand. Um, so I think building awareness that this is really not as complex as many people would make it seem. Um, and, and really starting to do it, right? Um, doing it either inside your team as an experiment just to, um, just to get a feel for what it looks like. You could do it yourself. Um, you can do a value stream map from your perspective. And oftentimes that's a really great exercise is to just try and see what do I understand about what we're doing, right? And then you can identify some gaps and then go have really great conversations with people where you say, I don't really understand this part. It's like, do you know what happens here? Because I'm trying to you know, build my understanding of, of what's going on. And it can be a great way for to have very high value conversations. Um, but I think that, you know, we're, we're just going to see every organization uh, adopt value stream thinking and value stream mapping and management as a core practice. Um, it's just, just getting started now, but it's going to explode because there's really no outcome. There's, there's no uh, future where we focus less on value and less on customers. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, with that, thank you very much, Steve. It's been wonderful to have uh, such thank you. great insight into your into value stream and giving us a brief introduction to the topic. As you said, there's a lot more here. Um, and as Joanna and I were putting together our book, you were a great help with us to contribute to this and add in the idea of value stream. And Joanna mentioned this idea of the customer journey and the linking to value and the common, you know, it's not just putting things into a backlog, but value, delivering value is a key element to that. So um, just like to remind folks who are on the call or listening to this, that we have put together an online course. We do have a chapter on value stream mapping, large part to thanks to Steve, where we have split it into some short lectures that we will give um, uh, practical skills to product owners to be able to do not only think about value, delivering value, but also use an iterative approach and getting customer feedback and the importance to customer feedback. We do this through a collection of um, applied, story, applied examples, but also templates that you can use as well. So hopefully you get a chance to look, look, for the, uh, look at that, really getting tongue tied. So as we are at the top of the hour, so do thank you very, very much for everyone um, coming and showing up. Uh, this afternoon, beautiful afternoon here in Toronto. Please come and visit us at newgenp.com to get more. As I said, the link to this session will be on this, as well as the link to Steve's website where you can get more as well. Um, and Trish is just reminding, oops, Trish is just reminding us of the uh, open uh, Toronto space on June 13th to remind you about that. If you want to learn more about product uh, ownership and discuss some situations with us, please contact us with Joanna and I. We're glad to have a virtual coffee because we can't have a real coffee with you anymore. And we will be having um, these webinars frequently. We'll plan one for about a month or so from now with some more focused on tools. So if you have anything that you're interested in, please let us know. So with that, thank you very much for joining. Have a great uh, rest of your day and a great weekend. And hopefully weekend. see you on the product uh, owner community soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye Thank now. you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.